Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are delighted to welcome you all here in a normal, hot, muggy Washington day. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's air conditioned here, and I'm the engineers are on site. They'll keep us cool. So I look forward to spending the day with you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president here at CSIS, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you for this conference. And very, very happy that the vice foreign minister could join us today. He, you know, I, you, you know, the old tradition is you had to get permission from the emperor to leave Tokyo. You know, and and I think that's still a custom that happens. And so he had to get special permission from the government to be able to come. And we're delighted that uh, Kishi-san is with us today. And thank you for being here. He is going to say some words of welcome uh, to all of us. He's a well-known figure to Americans who have expertise in Japan, but he doesn't spend enough time in Washington himself. So we're grateful that he's here today and is going to be sharing a few words with us. Special thanks to Charles Rivkin, who's going to be our keynote speaker. And, uh, and uh, I've just, my first opportunity to meet him, and I can now tell, understand why he has such a dynamic reputation in the State Department. Um, this is kind of a little bit of an artificial conference topic, you know, looking to the past, you know, uh, in 1964. 1964 was in some sense a very pivotal year here in America, but my heavens, what a kind of, it really was a re, kind of a remarkable coming out period in Japan. It was, Japan became a member of the OECD, a very significant acknowledgement within only 20 years to have Japan become a, one of the leading club members of the developed nations. Uh, uh, Japan had uh, introduced to the world stage uh, the Shinkansen. Yeah, this was 50 years ago. Interesting. Now, I think if you were to take, you know, I think there are like 300 Shinkansen trains a day, been operating for 50 years. If you take all of the time that a Shinkansen, the entire fleet for 50 years has shown up late, it was less than my train trip back from New York last week. I mean, it took me two hours to get to Washington, two hours late. I think the entire fleet for 50 years has not been an hour late altogether. So a remarkable story, and it's still one of the leading technologies in the world, and, uh, and it's 50 years ago. It was, uh, you know, it was also 50 years ago that uh, Japan hosted the Olympics, and Japan is preparing to host again the Olympics. And it's, again, one of these signal statements that this remarkable country is able to pull together in such a wonderful way. And it was a, a, a milestone at that time. And so we're looking back not to, uh, not to dig out the nuances of history, but to pull out the themes of the future. And I think that's what today is going to be about. This is about uh, Japan now rediscovering itself. The last several years have not been so good. Uh, it's not because the foundation in Japan has been flawed, it's not. It still has a remarkable workforce, a tremendous sense of cohesion in society, a uh, sense of shared purpose. Those of you that have visited Japan after Fukushima, you know, a country that was already the most energy efficient country in the world and was able to accommodate a contraction of of electricity production by 25% and life still proceeded normally. It was remarkable. This is an absolutely remarkable country. Its politics hasn't always been so supportive of this great country, but we're seeing this change now. And the energy that's coming forth out of the Abe administration is really the foundation and the reason for this conference. So even though we're going to use the reference of the past, it's really to be a focus for our future and how we're thinking about this remarkable country and its role. So we're delighted to have you here. Uh, Matt, do, you, do I say further words of introduction? I think, yes. uh, I, well, I, I don't think I, I would be a diminishment if I tried to prolong any longer your hearing from uh, Senior Fi uh, Vice Foreign Minister uh, Kishi-san. Uh, he is a familiar figure. He has been working with us for many years, and we're delighted that someone of his reputation and standing was willing to come. So would you, with your applause, please welcome and greet Vice Foreign, Senior Vice Foreign Minister uh, Kishi-san. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Hamre, for your kind of, uh, introduction. I'm delighted to be here. 
Before I start, let me express my uh, deep condolences over the passing of uh, Ambassador Howard Baker. Ambassador Baker was the United States uh, ambassador to Japan when uh, we reached the 150th anniversary of uh, Japan-US relationship, a true milestone. He contributed pr profoundly uh, to the enhancement of uh, Japan-US uh, alliance and the friendship and goodwill among the uh, peoples of uh, two countries. I renew my uh, sincere respect uh, for the achievement of Ambassador Baker and pray that he may rest in peace. 50 years ago, in 1964, Japan hit a large uh, turning point. In that year, Japan joined the OECD. The first Shinkansen line opened and Tokyo hosted the Olympic Games. At the time, I was only five years old, but uh, still I remember what happened on the uh, day of the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. Everybody, every Japanese, 100 million people of Japanese, uh, all celebrated the Olympic Games. Of course, my family did. My family went out to attend the opening ceremony, left me home uh, alone. <laughs> so still I remember that. But anyway, after that, the large growth in Jap Japan's economy was uh, palpable. In that year, 1964, Japan was still a, a poor country, but thanks to financing from the World Bank, we were able to uh, build uh, advanced infrastructure such as uh, the Tokaido Shinkansen and the extensive highway system. This bold investment created the groundwork for Japan's jump and the economic growth. While it is said that uh, uh, deflation caused the Japanese economy in, uh, to stagnate these past 15 years, it is my belief that we Japanese statesmen should bring Japan back to full vitality. In the same way that uh, a stronger United States is benefited uh, to Japanese, a uh, stronger Japan is beneficial to the US as well. This was only the most important uh, point. My brother, Prime Minister Abe, uh, and uh, uh, President Obama discussed during their, their meeting shortly after the inauguration, February last year. With this understanding, Prime Minister Abe began efforts to strengthen defense cap capabilities and vitalize Japan, bringing back Japan Japan's energy and thus strengthening uh, the Japan-US alliance. In terms of the economy, Prime Minister Abe forged Abenomics. He vowed that no vested interest will remain immune from my drill, sending a clear message. On June 24th, a new Japan growth strategy with concrete plans was released by the cabinet. The Abe administration strongly believes that uh, <coughs> reaching an agreement on TPP is the key link to the economic strategy. This bold economic strategy presents a great opportunity for American cooperation as well. In the midst of uh, all these efforts, we, we are encouraged by the fact that uh, this Back to the Future seminar on Japan is held in the United States, uh, particularly at the famous and uh, influential CSIS. It is extremely significant that we are sharing our views today into Japan's past 50 years and envisioning Japan 50 years from now. My mission for the coming 50 years is to help Japan grow stronger and together with the United States, help bring about a, uh, help bring about a better world. I believe that all of you who have gathered here today 
share in this conviction. I'm honored to have all of uh, your support for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Minister Kishi. Uh, we're honored that you came and joined us today, uh, and uh, we we're very uh, pleased to have your comments, which helped to frame this, uh, this conference, and so I'm very grateful personally. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair here at CSIS, and uh, let me join uh, John Hamry in welcoming you to CSIS on a very hot day. I uh, apologize for that. Um, also, um, recognize our online viewers. We have a good following always online, and uh, we, we uh, give them a, a warm welcome as well. And you can follow us on Twitter um, at, the, at CSIS and at CSIS Simon Chair. Uh, so, um, uh, and let me also thank the Embassy of Japan and Central Japan Railway for making this, uh, this event possible today. Uh, so I am going to uh, save my own thoughts about Japan 1964 for the first panel, which I will be moderating. So I would want to just skip straight to introducing our uh, first keynote speaker. Uh, I have the honor of introducing um, Assistant Secretary Charles Rifkin, who is Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs. Uh, you have the biographical information about Assistant Secretary Rifkin in your packet, so I won't uh, go through all of it here. But what comes through to me is uh, not only that he's had an impressive career, both in business and in uh, government, uh, but he sure knows how to land a dream job. Uh, it's, it's not enough that he worked in television for 20 years and uh, ran the Jim Henson Company, which, as you all know, uh, created the Muppets. Uh, but he also uh, served as ambassador to France. Um, and uh, that's about as uh, nice a, a job as you can land, I think, but a, a very important one. What's not in his biography is that he was the first ambassador to France to jump out of an airplane, uh, which he did to commemorate the, uh, the D-Day landings in 2012, and I think he also landed an F-18, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So. Uh, uh, so that's great. So he obviously brings a lot of energy to everything he does, and we certainly hope that he's doing that at the State Department, which he joined about three or four months ago, uh, running economic affairs, which is critically important. Uh, and it's something, if I can just quickly, shamelessly advertise a project that uh, we're doing in the Simon Chair, we're going to be issuing a report in a few weeks about economic statecraft uh, and about how the State Department can, uh, can uh, do an even better job at uh, economic uh, statecraft. And so we, uh, we look forward to giving that and sharing that with you, Assistant Secretary Rivkin. But with no further ado, let me introduce uh, Assistant Secretary Rivkin. Thank you, Matt, John. Um, I appreciate the kind introduction. It, it, it's true, I did. Um, jump out of an airplane, it wasn't in the job description, and, and it's true, I did uh, land on a carrier in an F-18 Super Hornet, and those are both examples sometimes of how it's, um, it's better not to ask permission from Washington when you're abroad, because I don't think they would have said yes to either of those uh, activities. A little bit harder when you're at state, no more jumping. But I really appreciate you uh, inviting me here today. It's an honor to be here, and my greetings to all the participants who um, are going to be part of today's events, including Senior Vice Minister Kishi, Ambassador Sasai, and other representatives of the Japanese government, Japanese private sector, including JR Central Chairman Kasai. So as was mentioned by Matt, the perspective that I bring to you today is informed by many experiences. As the CEO of a, of a media company in California, where I often found myself in Japan working to expand our business and our collaboration. As a former U.S. ambassador to France, where I understood and got to know the power of the U.S. Embassy abroad and what an embassy can and can't do on behalf of the U.S. government, and currently as Assistant Secretary of State for Economic and Business Affairs. As the newly appointed Assistant Secretary, I haven't been in the job long, um, I now have the chance to see opportunities more than just business to business. I can see it on a much bigger scale, of course, and this, and this means between our two countries. And um, I'm looking forward to the forthcoming trip that I will be taking to, uh, to uh, Japan and China and Singapore later this fall. But in advance of that, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about the enduring and important relationship between our two countries and the bright future that I am confident 
Japan is well positioned to realize. Today's theme is, uh, is an excellent way, as was said in a few minutes ago, for all of us to take stock of Japan in the watershed year of 1964 and the Japan of today. And to someone who has worked in the entertainment sector, it speaks to me in a very specific and particular way. For me, the key word is story. Now, in the creative industry, especially Hollywood, that word carries a lot of weight. It's what that industry does. Uh, whether we're talking about video games or television shows for children or action movies. But story is not that industry's exclusive domain. For one thing, it's central, it's a central component in history. And as I've come to realize in my, in my new capacity, it's central to our understanding of economics. All too often, I believe we tend to think of economics in a dry and theoretical way. The flow of money, the cycles of boom and bust, and so forth. But on a more engaging and significant level, it's about real people and the decisions they make based on their resources, values, beliefs, opportunities. So as we look back at Japan in the year 1964, I think of the story of the Japanese people's willingness to embrace the future. In 1964, Japan had just reemerged as a developed nation. It had joined the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. Its latest inventions like the bullet train its electronic calculators and sophisticated timekeeping devices used at the Tokyo 1964 Olympics were wonders of the modern world. And as host of these Olympics, Japan for the first time broadcast the spectacle via satellite and in color. Uh, the world recognized the story. Japan had become an innovative leader, the very epitome of modernity, a whole nation had embraced the future at every level of society, from its political leaders to its electronic inventors, from its business leaders to its consumers, eager to buy those color TVs and get on those bullet trains. 50 years later, today, Japan and the Asian, and the Asian region as well as the United States face a distinctly 21st century set of choices. The challenge for all of us now is not industrial modernization, but globalization. In 1964, the key to growth was technology and capital. Today, in 2014, technology is still critical. But the key question is no longer how to pay for it, but how to use it. The economies of the future stress innovation, entrepreneurship, and global openness to goods, services, and ideas. Thinking in particular about Japan, my hope is that it will consider a balance between preserving its underlying social fabric and embracing reforms that can move the economy to the next level and allow it to once again act as the leading influence on the global stage. I believe that Japan's influence will be determined primarily through private sector innovation, but it is also important to consider the role Japan will play in global standards and rule structure, like the World Trade Organization, APEC, and the OECD. As Japan embraces and steps forward as a global leader, it will find a reliable and committed partner in the United States of America. Japan and the United States helped shape and build the Asian economic miracle together and I expect that we will continue to be an effective team in the future. The most encouraging signs of all are visible in Japan itself. Like in 1964, it's on the rise again. And as part of its revitalization, it's asking the difficult questions. For example, Prime Minister Abe's third arrow includes the recognition of three vibrant segments of the potential workforce ready to bring new vigor to the economy. As everyone here knows, these are women, young people, and foreign workers. Prime Minister Abe has called for at least 30% representation for women in the private and public sectors in leadership positions. And we fully applaud this ambitious ben benchmark, 
which would greatly contribute to Japan's economic growth. And I'm pleased to hear that Japan, following the Prime Minister's commitment at UNGA last year, will host the World Assembly on Women in September to discuss women empowerment. Many young people in Japan are eager to contribute to Japan's innovative economy. But the seniority system in many companies keeps them waiting in the wings. By giving them opportunity, those companies will not only benefit from having more innovators, but greater profitability. Foreign workers are also poised to contribute. By joining the Japanese economy, they would help to meet the needs of many businesses which may not be able to survive without them. These are culturally and politically sensitive matters, I understand, and not only in Japan. But many friends of Japan believe that it's demographics and potential for looming labor shortages that require consideration of new and innovative responses. A second component is the powerful and enduring partnership between our two countries. Japan is a treaty ally and the cornerstone of our rebalance to Asia. And for that reason, we consider Japan's economic rejuvenation to be a critical U.S. national security priority. We want to see a vibrant, economically confident Japan as a trading partner, as a source of technology, as well as a leader and a positive role model for all of Asia. That's why we're working hard to take this partnership to yet another level through the successful completion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Both Japan and the United States are deeply engaged in negotiations to bring the agreement to a successful conclusion, knowing that the benefits an ambitious agreement can bring to all parties involved are enormous. TPP will open markets, create new opportunities, support job creation, and greatly support Japan's efforts to increase economic growth. Just as the 1964 Olympics provided a catalyst for Japan's growth development, it can provide a critical boost to the government's proposed reforms. The Trans-Pacific Partnership will help build a new architecture of high standard rules for trade and investment, further deepen our engagement, and create a level playing field, not just between our two countries, but all the other countries and TPP members. They currently number 10. But more countries are expressing their interest in joining. And as more of them agree to sign up to its ambitious commitments, TPP will serve as a platform for broader regional economic integration. That, in turn, would serve as an important model for other trade agreements in the region and throughout the world. TPP was one of the main topics that President Obama discussed with Prime Minister Abe in Tokyo in April. And our TPP negotiations continue to build on the progress that was made in those meetings in Japan. Like all the TPP parties, we're committed to achieving a comprehensive, high standard, 21st century outcome because we recognize that this is how you generate the greatest economic benefits and do the most to achieve true regional economic integration. By working together to create a high standard TPP, the United States and Japan can chart a future course that fosters prosperity, security, and welfare for the citizens of both nations and the Asia Pacific as a whole. As Prime Minister Abe said, and I quote, I believe that future historians will write that TPP open the Asia-Pacific century. Japan, he said, must be at the center of the Asia-Pacific century. In the year 2014, this is still a story in mid-process. The obvious question is, how is it going to turn out? We will continue to provide our part in the ultimate answer through our many joint efforts to build a set of rules for trade and investment that are open, free, transparent and fair. Through the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs and our partners in the State Department and across various U.S. government agencies, we support Japan's efforts to go to the next level. Our Commercial and Business Affairs Office has worked with our embassy in Tokyo 
Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, and the private sector to explore ways to promote more innovation and entrepreneurship in Japan, and with encouraging response. On my upcoming visit to Japan, I, I'll be seeking ways to support these and other efforts and to do my part to help build on the two-way foreign direct investment relationship, the strong relationship that exists between our two countries. We are also preparing for the next internet economy dialogue, which reflects our evolving joint interests in a new economy being created and shaped by technology and connectivity. And we strongly support a trusted travel and traveler partnership with Japan that would yield great benefits, especially for business travelers. We are, as many here know, pursuing even greater opportunities in the aviation sector, which is a direct responsibility of, of mine in the Economic Bureau, including the further opening of Haneda Airport. And that's another issue that I intend to discuss on my upcoming trip. But ultimately, the answer to that question, how does it turn out, is going to come from stakeholders on both sides. Chief among them are Japan's government, private sector, and its 127 million Japanese consumers. There are critical years ahead, perhaps none more so than the year 2020. That is the year that Prime Minister Abe has set for his 30% representation goal for women, and also for making Japan the world's most IT-advanced nation. But it is the year that our two countries are, are working as global partners to advance a post-2020 international agreement on climate change. And it's the year when Japan once again hosts the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The 2020 Olympics in Japan will be a fascinating bookend to 1964, giving Japan the opportunity to show the world that it did address the tough questions, that it did take those decisive steps. When I attended the OECD Ministerial Council meeting in May, I heard Prime Minister Abe call for an international economic order of fair and impartial rules for competition. He also called for a forward-leaning economic reforms, including workplace opportunity for women and a new era of innovative economic growth in his own country. And he said, and I quote again, the vigorous economy that was once brimming with vitality as the engine of the world growth has returned once again. We'll be all watching Japan's progress with great hope and support, knowing that in the global architecture in which we all live, success is no longer confined within borders. It's shared beyond them. If Japan embraces the future, that it aspires to, we will all be carried along. Thank you very much. I can take questions. Okay. Here. Let okay. me just let me just jump in. Um, thank you, Mrs. Secretary Rifkin. That was really a, a terrific speech that not only focused on our theme of Japan then and now and and Japan next, uh, but also put this in the context of what Japan of Japan's importance and significance to the world uh, in the economic realm and in other realms. So we really appreciate that, uh, that opening um, uh, presentation. Uh, Assistant Secretary Rivigan has agreed to take a few questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and please identify yourself. Um, do we have questions? Yes, sir. Can you just wait for one second? Thanks. Sorry, I'll stand there. Um, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> My name is John Pong from ECCO. Um, yesterday, we have seen some media reports about the TPP negotiation between the uh, United States and Japan. A media report said that the U.S.-Japan has uh, just uh, um, to, to uh, restore or restart some kind of negotiation, in particular in five areas of market access. Do you have any comments about this kind of report? Thank you. Well, I do uh, have comments, and our, our bureau at the State Department is working very, very closely with the USTR on TPP, which, as you know, is a huge priority for President Obama. And before discussing any individual um, uh, issues, I, I just think it's important to remind ourselves again and, and publicly that this partnership accounts for 40 percent, if we pull it off, 40 percent of global GDP and around 30 percent of world trade. It represents a region of 800 million consumers. 
and it's home to some of the largest and fastest growing companies in the world, which I'm told uh, will contribute almost one half, one half of future global GDP growth in the coming decades. And when you think about those stakes, I think it's important that we think about those stakes because we, have to, we can't get stuck on any one issue. They're complex and they're tough, but the stakes are enormous and it's important for the world that we see this through. So to answer your question, in the last um, three days, actually, there have been intense negotiations uh, between our, uh, our parties, our, our countries, and uh, they've been, they're focusing on the key issues, which are agricultural access and, uh, and autos. And the sincere hope of our negotiators is to build on the momentum that was created during the President's trip to, uh, to Japan. And, you know, they're tough issues, but we really are making progress. There have been, as you mentioned, detailed discussions on the five sensitive product areas. And it's not for me to discuss uh, exactly where those stand. I'll leave that to USTR, because the truth is that um, there's going to be a chief negotiators meeting in Ottawa uh, next week. So, um, but I believe, and I've been told by representatives both at state and USTR, that we are making progress. And there certainly is a will on both sides to try to find solutions to these complex issues because the stakes are so large. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Professor Patrick. Uh, Hugh Patrick. Um, when will fast track authority be renewed? It seems to me, we talk a lot about the negotiations, but on, on the American side, we have to also get our act together. That, that's my sense of this, and, and I'm sure that's one of your major new challenges. What is your thinking about how we're going to proceed? Well, sir, of course, that's a critical question, and fast track authority, or otherwise known as TPA, um, is a high priority for our administration. It's, uh, it's key to our over econo overall economic and strategic objectives. And, and, um, but in our opinion, and in the opinion of Ambassador Froman, it is not required in order to close this deal. And it is a little bit chicken and egg in that um, when we're able to resolve the issues and we're able to present Congress with a real deal, it'll be a lot easier for Congress to discuss TPA. Because right now they don't really, you know, they're being informed but they need something more concrete with, with which to act. That's my personal opinion. Um, but I can tell you that USCR and the State Department, they are constantly briefing members of Congress, and we are constantly working on a dual track during this negotiation. We're negotiating a deal, and we're also talking to Congress and keeping them apprised so that we can achieve TPA. Um, I don't know if you saw, but our president um, suggested that uh, this deal could be closed by the end of the year. And I just read a report that the Japanese embassy indicated maybe even by the end of November. So uh, that implies that we have great momentum, but certainly the TPA is not going to get in the way of this happening. Maybe one more question? Okay, Jeannie. Thank you, Secretary. My name is Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Thank you for your work with Japan. Um, Talking about economy, would you talk about the energy, the connectivity, freedom of navigation and freedom of aviation uh, between Japan, U.S., and the Southeast Asia, and in particular, the partnership with Vietnam? Thank you. I'm sorry, freedom of uh, navigation and connectivity um, in, uh, in air. Energy, air. connectivity, freedom of navigation, freedom of aviation between Japan and Southeast Asia, yes. and in particular with Vietnam? Yeah, I, I, um, uh, I don't have um, anything specific to, uh, to, to be able to share with you. I, I just know that these are all issues that we care deeply about and are working closely with our partners, both in Vietnam and Japan and throughout the region. Um, I, uh, I don't have any, any specific uh, issues to, to confront. I will, I will say that, that uh, um, what you raise is so interesting to me because um, John Kerry, uh, when he came to office, Secretary Kerry said that economic policy is foreign policy, and foreign policy is economic policy. And it is why he hired a whole team of people, myself included, inside the Economic Bureau to advance our economic ties with our friends in Vietnam and in Japan and elsewhere and our allies. 
And the impact on politics, the impact on foreign policy is evident. Um, so it is the closer we, we, uh, we bond with our friends, the more we, we address and discuss any frictions that exist between our economies, the better allies we are on a global strategic and security basis. Um, I, I don't have anything specific to, to add, but I, 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 I hear your, your, your question, and I, and I know it's important to the U.S. government, and these ongoing uh, talks continue. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry, but um, I, I, have to, uh, I have to get going, but I really appreciate the chance to speak to you today, and uh, I look forward to talking to a number of you um, when I get back from Japan for the first trip, the first of many trips, and I certainly hope that during my time as Assistant Secretary, uh, we will continue to advance even further the important strategic and economic relationship between our two great countries. So thank you so much for this chance. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.